Hey there folks, welcome to my quick and dirty review of the Zorky 4 Soviet rangefinder. So uh, today I'm going to talk about some of the functional aspects of this camera uh, for those of you who may have purchased one recently or are considering purchasing one. Um, I, th these cameras do come with a fascinating history. That's one of the reasons many people enjoy collecting Soviet rangefinders. I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, I will link down below to several reviews of this camera which do discuss the history behind them. Um, I recommend these reviews. I think they're, they're well written and very informative. Um, I, I will also link down below to the SovietCams.com page concerning the Zorky 4, uh, which details the various model changes um, um, uh, over, over throughout the production run. So you can take a look at your Zorky 4 and try to match it up to the descriptions and photographs on the Soviet Cams website um, to learn a little bit more information about your particular model in terms of when it was produced, what features does it have, and so forth. Um, so. Let's begin with the top plate. Uh, the Zorky 4 was produced from 1956 to 1973 for a total production run of 1.7 million units, making it one of the most popular and readily available Soviet rangefinders um, made. And they're not hard to find and they're not expensive. So let's take a look and see what you get. Um, the top plate, beginning on this side, we have the film advance knob, and that turns easily like so. It should turn fairly smoothly and easily. Um, I've noticed many comments online about people who get these things and complain about how hard the knob is to turn. If your knob does not turn easily, that does not mean the camera is poorly designed. Rather, it simply means it needs to be lubricated. Um, if the camera is properly lubricated, then it should not be a problem to turn the knob. Knob advance is really no big deal. It's not that inconvenient. I simply do not see the advantage in, uh, in simply deploying a, a, a crank. It's, it, the, the cranks, sure, it's a little bit easier, but the knob's no big deal. If yours isn't turning smoothly, you, your camera needs to be lubricated. Um, next over we have the, well, first of all, in, in, the, in the center of the knob we have the, um, the film counter. The film counter is manually set um, and is manually set against this index mark here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, all you do is you, you see this section is, has raised serrated edges. That's so your thumb can get good purchase in there. And you just stick your thumb down and turn. There's no magic to it, no secret. You just turn it until, until the zero lines up with the dot. And you are now ready to begin your roll of film. Um, next over we've got the shutter release button. And you've got this, you also notice there's a serrations on top of the shutter release button, which I thought was odd, but they are there for a reason. Um, and if you don't understand why they're there in the operation of this particular uh, shutter release button, um, you, it, it can cause you a lot of headaches, uh, as it did me. I had to go to a collector forum in order to get some advice on how to deal with a, a problem concerning this, and I made a separate video about it, which I recommend to you. Um, basically, the, the serrations are there to, um, to aid because you can, if you press down and turn left, the knob stays, the, the button stays down. And, um, and that, that works in conjunction with the B or bulb setting on your camera to keep the shutter open basically. And then push it down and turn again, the knob pops back up and it is now ready for normal operation. But if you don't know that and if it gets stuck on the, on the, on the lower position, um, it can lead you to believe that there is something wrong with your shutter, as I thought, um, but there's not. Likewise, the collar around the, um, the shutter release button, you, you depress that for, um, well, you depress it and turn clockwise, and then you depress it and turn counterclockwise, depending upon whether or not you want to hear. And that, that's, the, that's the rub, really. You depress and turn counterclockwise for advance, but the, the shutter release button you have to depress and turn clockwise. So wh what I did is that, that while, while depressing and turning the collar um, counterclockwise um, to, set it to, to, to set the film to advance, I also turned accidentally the, um, um, the shutter release button, which caused me some problems. Again, I made a separate video on that. Take a look at it. I explained it in, in, in more detail. Um, next, we've got the shutter speed dial. And the shutter speed dial has a few quirks. Um, firstly, 
Um, one of the first things you hear about Soviet rangefinders is do not change the shutter speed until after you advance the film and cock the shutter like so. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And you can see that the index mark on the shutter speed indicator, this is moving as I advance the, um, as I change the, um, or as I advance the film, and it also moves when I release the shutter. So pay attention. There you go. You see, see it move? Um, so this shutter speed, or this shutter, is now set at a speed of 125, I think. Yeah, 125. So, release. Well, now it looks like it's set at a speed of one half. Um, so that's another reason you don't want to change shutter speeds in, um, uh, without advancing, is you, you, you won't set it accurately because that index mark is no longer pointing at the accurate shutter speed. Although the main reason is that you can damage the mechanism if you attempt to change your shutter speeds in this camera um, prior to advancing the film, you can damage the internal mechanism. That's a big, big no-no on Soviet rangefinders. So we're going to advance there. Now we can change the shutter speeds, which raises its own issues because the shutter speeds here, um, you see they're very close together and to the left of each number is a tiny little dot. And those tiny little dots are very close together and they need to line up with the index mark here, which continues down the side of the, um, uh, of the knob here. That index mark continues. So you've got to line this up with the tiny little dot next to the number you want. Um, and that can be a challenge. Again, for, for eyes over 40, that's, that can be a bit of a challenge. I, I really think this is a young person's camera. Uh, this really is a camera for young people with strong, healthy eyes. Um, now, Here's another quirk. So I'm gonna, uh, in order to change shutter speeds, I lift and turn. So lift, turn, it's now set at 500. You can see the shutter speed dial, this, this part of it. Seat back in, so, okay. Um, now, if I try to turn it to, let's turn it to a slower speed. For example, 1 15th right here. Let's try that. Um, well, I'm going to try to seat that back down, and it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's as if it doesn't seat properly or fully. Um, you can see that gap there, which you don't see when it's set for a higher shutter speed, like 125. There, see that gap disappears. Um, and I suspect that's a result of the fact that these old, um, well, that these rangefinders use uh, two separate internal mechanisms for high speeds and low speeds. Um, that's why many of the older rangefinders, not merely Soviet, but from other companies as well, had two separate shutter speed dials, one for high speeds and one for low speeds. Um, th those two dials corresponded to two separate mechanisms to control high shutter speeds and low shutter speeds. I believe the Zorki maintains the two separate internal mechanisms, but only, uh, but has, has um, but the interface is, unif is, is unified in, in the form of this dial. Um, and, and I suspect that the dividing line between high and low speeds is 125 and 60, because when I, when I set it to 1 60th, it doesn't seat down all the way, and when I set it to 125, it does. So that's what I think is going on. You also have a, um, another index mark right here, which corresponds to this letter X. If I turn this ring here, I now see a letter M, or I think that's an M. In the Latin alphabet, that's an M. I don't know what it is, it's Cyrillic. I guess it's an M, I don't know. Um, but that relates to flash function. Um, and the M, I assume, would be for some kind of flash bulb, whereas the X, uh, again, I'm guessing, would be for you know, xenon lamps, which is what we use today. Um, there is a flash socket here. I've never used flash with this camera. I'm not sure if, if what I've just showed you is a, a reminder dial or whether it's actually functional and, and controls the function of this in, in some way. I'm really just not sure. I do not use flash with Soviet rangefinders. If you want to, then uh, you, you may need to do a little extra research. I'm, I'm not sure what to tell you about that. Next, next over, we've got the uh, uh, cold shoe, the uh, accessory shoe. There are no electrical contacts here, so you can mount accessories, but um, uh, there's no, well, it's, anyway, like I said, I do not use flash with old Soviet rangefinders. Um, next over, rewind knob, and this. This causes some consternation. A lot of folks get a, a Zorky look through the viewfinder and it's blurry and they're, they're frustrated and they think, oh man, I got a lemon, I got a rotten camera. Maybe not, um, maybe not. The, the Soviets really liked diopter adjustment for some reason. 
Don't know why, but most if not all Soviet rangefinders came with a diopter adjusting feature. So if you look through your viewfinder and it's blurry, um, try the diopter adjustment. That'll probably fix it. Back of the camera, we've got the, the this, I, you know, I have no idea what kind of covering this is, except that it's fairly common on, on later production Soviet rangefinders. The earlier production rangefinders um, had sort of a nicer, well, it's all fake leather, but I mean, it was a nicer fake leather. This is, you can't even call this fake leather. It's not even good fake. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what the heck this is made of. Um, we've got the viewfinder port, uh, KMZ logo, serial number with the first two numbers indicating year of production. So this camera was made in 1969. Um, let's see here. The front of the camera, we've got a, the viewfinder window, the rangefinder window, the flash socket, um, which I've never used. Um, a word about the viewfinder and the rangefinder window. So when I took this in to the legendary Yaakov on Allenby Street in Tel Aviv to have it CLA'd after, after acquisition, um, and I talked about, um, uh, it was basically I, I've rescued this from the rubbish bin. Um, I did a separate video on that if you're interested. Um, so I picked it back up at Yaakov's shop and he says, look, it's, the camera's working fine, but your rangefinder patch is faded. And it's, it's there, but it's, it's, it's dim. So what he did was he took a, a piece of plastic, just a shaded piece of plastic. Um, it's, I don't know how well you can see that. Anyway, he just took a, 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 a piece of clear plastic and um, inserted it into the viewfinder to dim the viewfinder. Now, why would you do that? Why would you deliberately dim your viewfinder? Uh, well, the reason is to create contrast between your viewfinder window and your rangefinder window. So now it, 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 uh, it's easier to focus because there's more contrast between the viewfinder and the rangefinder. And since I primarily use this camera outdoors on sunny days, uh, the, the dimmer viewfinder isn't a big deal. Um, but you know, if I were going to use it under different lighting conditions, it may be. And I may want to remove it. And you, know, you can take it out and put it back in. Uh, I only mention that because faded um, rangefinder patches are fairly common on these old, um, on the Soviet cameras and well, some of the Japanese ones as well. Um, and resilvering the rangefinder is really costly and it's simply not worth it. And I've, I've never heard of anyone even bothering to do that on a, on a Soviet camera. Um, so this was sort of a, um, you know, a, well, a practical solution to a practical problem. You know, as a practical matter, you know, you, he knows I'm not going to spend the money to resilver the rangefinder because um, that would, that would be like five times the cost of the camera anyway, or the, or the value of the camera. Um, so he says, "Look, this is what I did. If you don't like it, take it out." Um, so fine. Um, also, I've got a functioning self-timer on this particular model. Uh, so let's advance the, the, okay, shutter's cocked, very good. Self-timer, and the self-timer on this camera is released with this button here. Very good, all right, functioning self-timer. A uh, bit of a rarity on some of these older cameras, but this one works. Um, take a look at the bottom. We've got the, uh, the two keys for opening the back of the camera, which we'll do in just a second. And I've also got a, um, a tripod mount. This particular tripod mount is the standard Western or Japanese uh, gauge. Many of the earlier Soviet rangefinders had um, the Soviet gauge tripod mount, which requires an adapter. Um, I believe they sell those uh, at um, the Fedka website, F-E-D-K-A dot com, if I recall correctly, does have an adapter. If you have an earlier model with the Soviet uh, gauge um, uh, tripod mount. Okay, now let's take a look inside this thing. So we're going to open up the camera. We do that by deploying these two keys. Twist, 180 degrees, and gently remove the back. And I say gently for this reason. Watch, you'll see why. Here, that's why. So, as you remove the back of your camera, this it may fall out. On this particular model, this is a, this is a plastic take-up spool, um, which fell out here. Okay, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't stay on by natural tension. It will fall out of the camera, at least on this model. Um, I have a Fed 2 that has a removable spool, but it's metal and it it has enough like natural tension not to fall out. But this one falls out. Uh, be careful about that because once this thing is lost, you no longer have a functioning camera, you now have an attractive piece of period art. 
but not a functioning camera. So make art with your camera, not, do not make art of your camera. So um, likewise, if you didn't grow up with film and you're not accustomed to the idea of cameras opening up like this, you need to treat an open camera like an open wound. It is very sensitive. If you are changing film in the field, be careful not to get dirt and dust inside the mechanism. This is all very vulnerable right now, so be very careful. Likewise, don't drop your take-up spool. Watch, watch out for that. And whatever you do, whatever you do, you see all the mechanism here? You see this, this here? That's your shutter. Your shutter is a thin piece of cloth. Do not touch it with anything for any reason under any circumstances, period. You damage the shutter, the camera's dead. They're, they're not even worth fixing. I mean, if you're mechanically inclined and you can find the parts, maybe you can do it yourself. But it, again, it's just it's not cost effective to, to replace shutters in these old Soviet rangefinders. Um, so do not, do not, do not touch that shutter curtain under any circumstances whatsoever. Likewise, in the bottom here, you've got your, um, your shutter release mechanism is contained in, in over here. So you know, just, just be very careful when you get the thing open. Again, I've done a, uh, I've done a separate video on loading film into this camera. So learn how to load film, but don't touch anything that doesn't need to be touched um, and replace it gently like so, turning the keys here and here and there and there and all right and that is the um, that is your basic function of your Zorky 4. Now the Zorky 4 came standard or most of them I think most of them I don't think all of them most of them came standard with the Jupiter 8 lens. Um, Jupiter 8 is a wonderful wonderful lens I've, I've used um, this is my second Jupiter 8 lens I have another one that I bought um, years ago that I've been using on my Canon rangefinders. It's, it's just a phenomenal lens. I'm very happy with it. I think it's one of the greatest uh, classic uh, manual focus lenses out there, whether SLR rangefinder or whatever. It's just a, it's just a wonderful, wonderful lens. Um, and um, it is, of course, interchangeable. It has a the Leica thread mount, so you can screw it, unscrew it, take it off, put it back on. Um, and there is some compatibility issues between the Soviet uh, M39 lenses and the Japanese M39 lenses. Basically, um, the, there's a, well, most of them will, will interchange, but, well, no, that's not entirely true. Well, I'd watch out for the telephotos. The telephoto lenses are the ones that don't really interchange all that easily. Um, and. On this thing. You know, I think there's a reason that bayonet mounting caught on. It's not because the screw mounting was unsecure. It's because if you didn't align it properly, here we go. See, if you don't align it properly and you try to force it, then you can strip the threads and damage the, the both the camera and the lens. Um, so I've been using these things for years, and I still find it a little fumbly sometimes to, to, get, the, to get the lens started um, when, when screwing it on the camera. So if, if you have that problem, don't get bummed out. You know, I'm, I, I still have that issue from time to time. Um, but they, you know, it's, it's, well, you know, it's, it's just part of the um, quirky nature of these older rangefinders. I mean, the, the, these are not cameras that you buy because they're easy or convenient. These are cameras that you buy because they are fun, they're historic, um, they are very capable, they, uh, they accept a, um, um, a fascinating system of lenses. Um, if, you, if you're into the Soviet gear, my, my recommendation, get yourself a Jupiter 12 wide angle, get a Jupiter 9 telephoto uh, portrait lens. Uh, if you can find a Jupiter 3, these are nice. It's an old Jupiter 3, uh, 51 to 5, although the Jupiter 8 is a fine lens as well. And the turret viewfinder, uh, because the, um, the viewfinder in your Zorky 4 has no frame lines, is not parallax corrected, and is only framed for the 50 millimeter lens. So if you, go, if you mount anything other than a 50 millimeter lens on there, you'll need an accessory viewfinder. And um, this is a really good one. I might, I, mean, yeah, I might just do a separate video on this, this thing by itself, because uh, this, this really is a neat piece of kit. It 
uh, it, it works beautifully. It's well made. It's very well made, um, and it works really nicely. So that is my quick and dirty review of the Zorky 4. Um, I've probably left something out, but well, um, then, <laughs> well, it's quick and dirty. Yeah, I told you it was a quick and dirty review. Didn't say it was a complete review, did I? So anyway, um, check out the links below. I am going to link to some very helpful um, reviews on other blogs and websites, along with the Soviet Cams um, Collector website. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's a fun little camera. I really enjoy it. My, my, only, my main complaint is that there are certain features of this camera that just make it a bit of a challenge for, you know, for those of us over 40. Um, I really think that um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a great camera for younger people, though especially if you're young and you're curious and, um, and uh, you want to learn about the history of, of film photography. Um, uh, this is just a wonderful, wonderful uh, way to do it. Um, but, you know, it does have its quirks. Okay, um, I hope you found this video either informative or entertaining or amusing or a combination thereof. And if so, please do like and subscribe and check out the links below. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.